We give thanks for that opportunity. I want to give thanks to Wanda for her wonderful children's sermon. What a beautiful job of weaving together the theme of Father's Day and fatherhood and the story of Ruth. I told someone at the early, I said that the early service that somehow all these years of being a pastor, it had somehow escaped me that, that, that Rahab the prostitute was the mother of Boaz in this story. Well, somebody after the early service said, I can't believe you didn't know that. They were teasing me a little bit. I said, well, I knew, yeah, I knew that Rahab the prostitute was in the lineage of David. I just didn't put the connection that that was Boaz's mother there. But that's an amazing part of the story as well. So welcome on this Father's Day as we take a look at the story of uh, Ruth and the faith of a foreign woman. But, of course, in the background is the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father, who we would proclaim today, as Wanda did so beautifully in the children's sermon, is a good, good Father, perfect in all of His ways. Last weekend, as most of you know, I, I had the joy of officiating at my niece's wedding in Tennessee, and I'll tell you what, you think it's hot here, it was just as hot there, and add the humidity. I mean, we were out in this beautiful wedding venue, setting out in the country and on a hillside, and it was beautiful, but man, the sun was just baking us there, but it's at weddings that we often hear Ruth quoted, and you probably know this Bible verse by, by heart, where Ruth says to her mother-in-law Naomi, she says, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Well, let's take a closer look. Open up your Bibles to Ruth chapter 1. You had an easy week, church, only four chapters to read. Did you realize that? So if you didn't get those four chapters read, shame, 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 shame on you this week. I know that's not very politically correct to say shame. Um, but at any rate, only four chapters. Hopefully you got it read. If you haven't had your Bibles open all week, here's your chance. And let's take a look at the story as it begins in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, page 369, Naomi and Ruth, where it says this. Let's read it together. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, if you take a look, since your Bibles are open, here's the handiness and the helpfulness of having your Bibles open. You can see, do anybody know where Moab is? Well, it's right there. You can see in the map to the right there. Moab is right across the Jordan River there to the east. And so what country would that be today? Know your geography a little bit? It'd be, be, right, be right about in the middle of the country of Jordan today. Some, some of us have been to Jordan. Some of us were in Jordan about, a, about two years ago, right? Dwayne and Pat Sharp. We were just there seeing Petra. Now, Petra's quite a bit farther south. I looked that up on, the, on Google Maps the other day, but in Jordan there. So we're reminded right at the very beginning of the story that life is not always fair. For we live in a fallen world. We were reminded of that as a nation this last week in a horrible way. With the eruption of hatred and, and violence in Orlando, Florida. And I think that all Christians would have to agree. I hope all Christians would agree that God weeps. God weeps at such, such eruptions of hatred. And unfortunately, grief, you know, sometimes it, it'll, it'll bring out the best in us sometimes as a nation, like as with 9-11, but sometimes it brings out the worst in us too. So we've seen a lot of finger pointing and blame and oversimplification and vitriol on the internet and social media, but, but, but hopefully we can pray as a nation that as with the shooting a year ago, remember where the shooting was a year ago, right about this time? Charleston, where some African Americans were clearly targeted in a church in a church, uh, in a Bible study, on, on a Wednesday, that we can only hope and pray that as was the case there, that there would somehow be an eruption of, of goodwill and healing and forgiveness and, and, and grace. And we can only hope that as a nation, we might learn to do a better job of loving each other despite our differences. Did you notice in that opening song, we sang, Set Your Church on Fire, Win this nation back. It's really our prayer, isn't it? Set our church on fire. Win this nation back. We pray for healing 
in our nation, that we might come together and do a better job of loving one another. But certainly, we're reminded, again, that life isn't always fair. We live in a fallen world, and we're reminded of that even locally too, aren't we, with the horrible shooting in Bertha this last week and with several tragic car accidents this last week, a, a woman on, on 287 and a young couple in Boulder County reminded that life isn't always fair. We don't understand it, but we do understand that we live in a fallen world. We're no longer in the garden. And so as we take a look at the story of Ruth, as you read it through this week, you've read it before perhaps, as we read it this week, did you notice how the story goes from bad to worse very, very quickly? Very, very quickly in chapter one, it goes from bad to worse. I mean, at first, it's bad enough that there's a famine. I mean, none of us have ever been in a famine, right? No, I don't think anybody here has been in a famine. But it's bad enough they have a famine that forces them to leave Bethlehem, to leave their homeland, to move to a foreign land. But then what happens? Naomi loses her husband, and she not only loses her husband, she loses her two sons, her only two sons. How much worse can it get? The Bible invites us and, and urges us over and over again to reach out to orphans and widows, because in the ancient world, widows were considered the, the, the most fragile and, and desperate and, and needy of all of society. And so we don't blame Naomi a bit for feeling as if she were cursed. Take a look at chapter at verse 13 in chapter 1. In verse 13, Naomi expresses her, her grief. She said, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out from me. Ever felt that way? Losing a job might make us feel like the Lord's hand has gone out from us. Or losing one's health might make us feel like the Lord's hand has gone out from us. Or losing a loved one might make us feel like the Lord's hand has gone out from us. And surely we're reminded here in the story that life is not always fair for we, for we live in a fallen world. But we discover then in chapter 2 that indeed the Lord's hand has not gone out from Naomi. But just the opposite, the Lord's hand is reaching out to her, first through the remarkable love and loyalty of her foreign daughter-in-law, Ruth. What an amazing faith statement. In, verses, in verse 16 here, look again at what she says. She says, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. What a remarkable faith statement from a foreigner here. And she goes on to say in verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you from me. Now think about this for a moment. Last weekend uh, at my niece's wedding, they pledged till death do us part. We hear that at weddings, don't we? Almost always, till death do us part. Think about Ruth here. She's taken this pledge to a whole nother level, doesn't she? She has pledged till death do us part to who? Her mother-in-law, her foreign mother-in-law. How remarkable her love and loyalty. God's hand has not gone out from Naomi. Already it's reaching out to her, providing her with the love and loyalty of her foreign father-in-law. But who's next in chapter 2? Take a look at who the Lord uses next to reach out to Ruth. It's Boaz, who is Naomi's relative. And we're told at the beginning of chapter 2, he is a man of great standing. So we're reminded secondly in this story that, that blessings happen when we hang in there and when we step out in faith. As it turns out, Ruth's remarkable love and loyalty had become the talk of the town. When they get back into Israel, when they get back into, into Bethlehem, they become the talk of the town. So that Boaz has heard about this Ruth and her remarkable love and loyalty. So now the Lord uses Boaz to reach out to them. Notice what Boaz has to say to Ruth in chapter 2, verse 11. In verse 11 it says, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you came to leave your father and mother of your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know. Now notice in verse 12, 
the remarkable ministry here between Boaz and Ruth. In verse 12, he says, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I love the last part of that verse. Under whose wings... You have come to take refuge. That's, that's an image that we hear a lot in Scripture, don't we? Did you notice that that same image was lifted up at the end of our reading in the psalm for today too? Under whose wings you have taken refuge. Some of you might remember the song in the 80s. We used to sing it here. I think we sang it here a few times. We sang it more at King of Glory and Loveland. But it was kind of popular in Lutheran churches. Thy holy wings, O Savior, spread gently over me and let me rest securely through good and ill in thee. You have to love the faith and support of this man Boaz here. Did you notice in, in verse 12, he, he's, he's provided what for, for, for Ruth? First of all, he's blessed her, hasn't he? This is a blessing here. He says, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord God, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. So he's blessed her, but he's also complimented her, hasn't he? He's affirmed her. He has encouraged her. And he goes on to provide for her. And most importantly, he points her to the protection and providence of our God above. How remarkable. We're reminded that blessings happen when we hang in there and when we step out in faith. Who knows how God might position us this week to be a Boaz to someone in need. I was reminded of that last night just as I was preaching this sermon. At the beginning of the service, I said, hey, pray, pray, pray for our work campers. And maybe some of you saw this on the prayer chain. I said, I mean, I just got three phone calls from Rob Elwood. His pickup broke down, and he's got the whole big faith community trailer full of tools and supplies, and he's only halfway to Montezuma Creek. And I said, so pray for him it's that, that God will provide somebody. Well, then right before the sermon, as we had our passing of the peace, Scott Snyder said, well, what kind of hitch is it? And I said, well, I don't know what kind of hitch it is, but I texted Rob real quickly and said, what kind of hitch is it? And then I handed Scott the phone. Well, I don't think he listened to my sermon too much, or maybe he really listened to it, because by the end of the sermon, he, they'd been texting back and forth, and they had it all worked out. Rob and Erica were going to leave 6 o'clock this morning and pick up uh, and, and give them a good pickup and pick up his pickup and bring it back here. Anyway, the Lord provides. We never know how God might position us to provide a blessing to others, to provide an affirmation to others, encouragement to others to, to, to help someone else in need. And that's what we see in this story here. Blessings happen when we hang in there. It's tempting to give up too early. But when we step out in faith, know as it turns out, the Lord's hand had not gone out from Naomi at all. Just the opposite. And the blessings continue to unfold in this story. In chapter 3, we see how Boaz expresses kindness to Ruth there in verse 10. Let's read verse 10 together as a congregation in chapter 3, page 372, where it says this. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger man, whether rich or poor. We're reminded that love is patient and kind. You know, the Bible reminds us over and over again that we reap what we sow. And we discover that in life too, don't we? We reap what we sow. And if we sow kindness, oftentimes we receive kindness. If we sow love, we receive love. If we sow grace, we receive, we, we receive grace. So notice how the kindness builds in this story here. Naomi, the, 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 the kindness that Ruth shows to Naomi is noticed by Boaz. And so he recognizes that. And then the kindness that Boaz shows Ruth is recognized by Naomi. And the kindness between them continues to build. It must have been the 1980s, I think, when we, we first started hearing about random acts of kindness. And now that's a popular expression. We hear about people, you know, practicing random acts of kindness. Well, Pastor Steve Scogan in Cincinnati, Ohio, 
founded a church based on that principle. That's their big slogan. Their big mission is to provide random acts of kindness. And that church has grown to 7,500 worshipers every Sunday morning. They teach their people over and over again that there is great power in showing random acts of kindness, such as you know writing a thank you note to a clerk in a store or, or paying for the coffee or meal of a stranger or family in need. That showing God's love in practical ways has great power. And of course, Jesus says, by their fruit, you shall know them. And we know that talk is cheap. We need to live out our, our faith. And so not only are, is there great power in random acts of kindness, have you noticed that there's great power in random words of kindness? Words have great power, both to the good and bad. You can be having a good day, but if someone comes along with some little snotty or snippy comment, boy, your day just goes doesn't it? Exactly. It takes the wind out of your sails. But, but the good news is a, a, a random kind word can make your day, can brighten your day, can change your day. So we're invited as believers in Jesus to, to consider what's coming out of our mouths. And if it isn't kind, we should probably shut up, right? I don't know if you can say shut up in church, but maybe kind of, you know, if it's not kind, shut up. So we, we say to the staff, you know, and we try to say to our leaders here, you know, let, 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 Sunday morning we might have a little thing, that, criticism of this or that, but let's, 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 let's save it for Monday. Somebody asked me after last service, so who gets to hear the criticisms on Monday? And I said, why well, take Monday's off? No, just kidding. <laughs> but it, it, it comes to me eventually, it seems like. But really, let's, let's, let's protect one another from criticism and grumbling on Sundays and remember the Sabbath to keep it holy because words have power, great power, and we see the kindness expressed through words and through actions between Boaz and Ruth in this story. So we're reminded here that love is patient and kind. No, the Lord's hand had not gone out from Naomi. So that we're reminded at the end of this story that behind the scenes, God has been working for good, that indeed our Lord God is a good, good father. Take a look at how the women express it in chapter 4, verse 14. And let's read that together as a congregation as we close. That's page 373, the genealogy of David. In verse 14, it says this. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. Well, did that prayer come true? May he become famous throughout Israel? My goodness, that prayer was answered in a huge way because Ruth ends up becoming what? The great-grandma of King David himself, one of the most famous individuals in the whole Old Testament. And furthermore, as Wanda pointed out, the kids, Jesus himself, Christ Jesus comes from the lineage of King David. How remarkable. Is God amazing or what? Out of our brokenness, out of our loss, he creates something wonderful and spectacular, working for good. You know, God's providence is hard for us to understand. And God's providence is oftentimes beyond our understanding. So that we may, like Naomi, feel like God's hand has gone out from us. But it's in those moments that we are invited to remember that we but see in a mirror dimly. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we but see in a mirror dimly. So in those days or those weeks or those seasons in our lives where everything looks foggy, it looks foggy and we, can, we can't see the Lord's hand, we're invited to lean on the promises of God. The promise of Romans 8, 28, that God works for good in all things. God works for good in the midst of sickness. God works for good in the midst of loss. God works for good in the midst of brokenness. God works for good even in the midst of our mistakes and our sin. Certainly, God works for good through us. Whenever we choose to show random acts of kindness to others, whenever we choose to show generosity to others, whenever we choose to show mercy and grace towards others, Indeed, by the end of the story, we're reminded that our Lord God is a good, good Father, that he's perfect in all of his ways.
Let's pray. Gracious God, over and over again in Scripture, we see faith coming from surprising individuals. And in this case, a foreign woman who is going through the hardest of times. And so, Lord, God, we see that in our world, too, people that are going through hard times who express amazing faith. So, Lord God, we give thanks that you are, on this Father's Day, a good, good father. We give thanks for our fathers, those that have been father figures in our lives. We, we give thanks for them today. Some of them, Some of them are with us. Some of them are with you now. But we give thanks that you are perfect in all of your ways. And we do pray, Lord, that this week that you, would, that you would position us to be a Boaz to someone in need. That you would position us to show, to show your generosity, to reflect your generosity, to reflect your love, and to reflect your grace so that we might be a blessing to others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.